So welcome to our Mass on the fourth Sunday of Advent from the barn at Bombo on this uh, beautiful sunny morning here. So in the Gospel today we have the story of the Annunciation and uh, in preparation for the celebration of Christmas later this week. It's a very human story. It was written about 80 years after the birth of Jesus, so it represents uh, a great deal of reflection and pondering on the meaning of the birth of Jesus. It's not just a, a nice little fairy tale, but it's very human, and for that reason it captures our imagination. As a child I was, I had a very like most children, a very simple uh, human image of God. I believed in God. I didn't question that belief. And it was a inspiration to me. Of course, the idea, the image, the belief has changed over the years. But there was something valuable, I think, in having that child maybe childish, but childlike understanding of God as being there as a support, as a friend, as a friend in need. And I remember praying to God for instant interventions when something went wrong or there was some problem in my young life. And uh, I don't think I ever judged God about whether he uh, answered me or not. It was just good enough that he would be there and let me send my requests until the storm passed. But for many people, the biblical idea of God is, is too human, too much like a God created in our image, rather than us being created in God's image. And so there's a lot of argument and a lot of analysis and a lot of skepticism and a lot of rejection of the very idea of God. And that can be true. It can be too human, simplistic, superstitious. And it's been a controversial aspect of Christian faith since the very beginning. In the fifth century, when Cassian uh, taught meditation, uh, he taught it as a way of pure prayer to control this, what he called, anthropocentric heresy, the mistake of imagining God and getting stuck in our images of God. He called it an absurd heresy. It's an extreme, and it's a danger. But the other extreme, and equally dangerous perhaps, is to imagine and create in our minds, in our thoughts, a completely depersonalized God, a kind of abstract being or abstract state, not even a being, a state, and we end up divinizing our own consciousness. We end up, in a way, divinizing ourselves and thinking that that very small little flash of enlightened awareness or peace that I had yesterday is a sign that I am now fully, fully realized and I'm on a special path. If our image of God is too human, too much like ourselves, then sure, we play mind games with it. We remain locked in our own little world. Big ideas in a little world about ourselves, refusing to answer the knock on the door. And if you saw the uh, painting of the Annunciation at the beginning of Mass, we'll look at it uh, later after the Gospel, by Pontormo, 16th century Italian painter. And it's a beautiful uh, representation of Mary walking up some stairs. And she's got one foot just about to go onto the higher step when she becomes aware of the angel's presence and she just turns like that, that look of interest or surprise or 
Uh, it's just like awareness of a presence there. So there's a knock on the door of our lives, our souls. We may hear it, but we don't really become aware of it. And we refuse to respond because it's easier to be isolated and confined in our own minds. Covid has shown us that it's not good for man to be alone, as God said to Adam before he created Eve. All relationships, however, require an optimum distance. And that optimum distance is solitude. It's what allows relationship actually to happen. But social distancing, well, even that's included in it perhaps, but social distancing, such as we're becoming more and more conscious of now, the second wave and this new viral strain has started, it, um, it reminds us that a certain distance is necessary for relationship. It's that distance that allows us to allow the other person or whoever to be other than ourselves, not a projection. And the same is true of our relationship with God until the divinization is complete. So that social distancing in our present crisis is a sign of respect and love, in fact. We respect people's boundaries, not controlling them. And keeping a social distance uh, is not an infringement of human rights. It's our sign of concern for others' well-being as well as for our own. The experience of God, what we call spirituality, is really an experience not in one meditation, but not in the next, or not something we're aiming to increase or ambitious to achieve. But the experience of God is extended through all moments of life. It's not the ego's desire to be enlightened and holy, but the work of union that takes time and, and requires distance in order for intimacy with God to develop. The sign of this is what we're doing at this moment, sharing the spiritual journey with others, being pilgrims together, not just hitching a ride, but becoming one with others, so that becoming one with God isn't an ego project, but happens within our human condition, within our relationships with others. How can we love the God we cannot see if we cannot love those whom we can see. So there can be contemplative fundamentalists as well as religious fundamentalists. The contemplative fundamentalist is someone who's locked into the ego program of spiritual growth rather than the spirit's program, which is a loss of self, a gift of self, the way of love. We see this in the first reading today from King, which Henrietta is going to comment on, uh, when King David's ego is humbled and he remembers that he's, he's a servant of God's people. And then the second reading, which uh, Giovanni will comment on, uh, St. Paul expresses this passionate love focus on Christ as a, as a liberation from the isolated ego state. So let's be open to this, to this moment of community, of communion, where we allow the Word of God to communicate to us. And we hold, especially in our hearts today, those, those people 
who may be disappointed by the news of the restrictions on Christmas and the uh, deeper uh, shutdown that is taking place in many parts of the world. So let's pray that this may be a moment of friendship and communion for us all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. on us, forgive us, and bring us into the fullness of life. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech you, O Lord your grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ your Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. For he lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The reading is from the second book of Samuel. Once David had settled into his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his all the enemies surrounding him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, Look, I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go and do all what is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. But that very night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, Thus the Lord speaks. Are you the man to build me a house to dwell in? I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you on all your expeditions. I have cut off all your enemies before you. I will give you fame, as great as the fame of the greatest on earth. 
I will provide a place for my people Israel. I will plant them there and they shall dwell in that place and never be disturbed again. Nor shall the wicked continue to oppress them as they did in the days when I appointed judges over my people Israel. I will give them rest from all their enemies. The Lord will make you great the Lord will make you a house. And when your days are ended and you are laid to rest with your ancestors, I will preserve offspring of your body after you and make his sovereignty secure. I will be a father to him and he a son to me. If he does evil, I will punish him with the road such as men use, with strokes, such as mankind gives. Your house and your sovereignty will always stand secure before me and your throne established forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, there's a little conversation going on between David and God, which um, could be said in one line, which touched me when I read it. It is in your heart to build me a house where I shall dwell. It is in your heart to build me a house where I shall dwell. And it is in my heart to build you a house. Your offspring will be my son. The arch was a place of prayer where the Israelites were reminded of God's infinite and eternal presence. David's question was genuine. When Jesus taught for the offspring, when Jesus taught, he taught that we should go into our inner room, closing the door, and pray to our Father in heaven. When I was um, young, I liked very much Psalm 84, which I looked up. I can read a little bit from it. It is how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord God of hosts. My soul is longing and yearning and yearning for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my soul ring out their joy to God the living God. The sparrow herself finds a home and the swallow a nest for her brood. She lays her young by your altars. Lord of hosts, my King and my God. So I can relate to David's desire to build a house to the Lord. I remember learning that song by heart because it was part of my education, but I really loved it. Um, so I can relate and I think everybody of us can relate to it since in all of us is the awakened the desire to meditate to build our inner house. And also we all can relate to the battle which prevented David from building the house from stone and cedar. We all battle with uh, thoughts. And we all look forward to the time that our heart is not anymore a place of robbers. But that we can that we can receive swallow swallows and what was the other bird swallows will find a and s sparrows. sparrows will find a nest for their brood so that was what came to my mind and I hope 
you will over this Christmas time notice moments of sparrows and swallows finding a nest for their brood. Thank you. Psalm 88 in French. Ton amour, Seigneur, sans fin, je le chante. L'amour du Seigneur, sans fin, je le chante. Ta fidélité, je l'annonce d'âge en âge. Je le dis, c'est un amour bâti pour toujours. Ta fidélité est plus stable que les cieux. Avec mon élu, j'ai fait une alliance. J'ai juré à David, mon serviteur, j'établirai ta dynastie pour toujours. Je te bâtis un trône pour la suite des âges. Il me dira, tu es mon père. Mon Dieu, mon roc et mon salut. Sans fin, je lui garderai mon amour, mon alliance avec lui sera fidèle. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Glory to him who is able to give you the strength to live according to the good news I preach, and in which I proclaim Jesus Christ, the revelation of a mystery kept secret for endless ages, but now so clear that it must be broadcast to pagans everywhere to bring them to the obedience of faith. This is only what scripture has predicted, and it is all part of the way the eternal God wants things to be. He alone is wisdom. Give glory, therefore, to him through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I like very much that um, Henriette was struck by the image of the home and the swallows and the sparrows. And because in fact, at Christmas, Jesus is not able to be born in anybody's home because 
people are too busy, um, there's COVID. And, uh, so he and his parents come together in a makeshift place. It could have been a cave or it could have been a stable. And uh, on the Christmas wreath, we've come from a light-filled candle back to a darker purple candle. And, um, and I've, I've been reflecting on the difference of waiting at Christmas and waiting at Easter. They are waiting, and the one contains the other. But there is, and it's interesting, my mind wants to make them different. But the more I reflected on this, the more I realized that they, one really does contain the other. Like the in-breath contains the out-breath, and the out-breath, the in-breath. Or a wave washing up the beach is already being pulled by the undertow to come back. And, um, and I found out that St. Bonaventure and Duns Scotus, two Franciscan theologians, uh, felt very strongly that the Incarnation already contained the redemption of humankind. Because in the Incarnation, God comes amongst us and lets us know that it's good, not only is it good, but he's happy with it and us. As we hear in Genesis, he made on those seven days all these things and he saw that it was good. So last week the, the light candle um, and the presence of Mary in the story and Joseph and faithful people reminds us that, that there is a flame of this delight in God always in us and in creation. So in St. Paul um, there is this something, this flame, about um, encouraging us to stay awake. And I was recently reading parts of the diary of Marthe Robin, who was, is her, was beatified by Pope Francis um, earlier in November. An amazing young woman, mystic, who then for her whole life suffered incredibly this, the results of this encephalitis, but was also strengthened, just as St. Paul says, glory to him who is able to give you the strength to live according to the good news, the strength to live from the way that the incarnation and Christmas is contained and contains the passion of Christ and vice versa, and to live the whole teaching Christ. It's not something we can do on our own, but it's something that grace does. And I was so surprised to hear her say this, which, which is something we, we often, uh, we, we are, we, comes up in the meditation community as something that a, a legalistic person would say in order to trip you up, because you're saying how important meditation is in your life. So she writes, if I was asked, what is better, contemplative prayer or holy communion? Both are highly recommended. But if one were to be preferred to the other, I think I would say contemplative prayer because contemplative prayer is an attitude and an immediate preparation for holy communion. I, I, was, I found that so moving because it, it's the, the two waitings, the waiting at Christmas and the waiting at Easter. And she goes on to say, in fact, contemplative prayer requires much more effort and is harder for us than being at Holy Communion, which is Christ's work coming towards us and in us. And um, so I just, I just wanted to close also with saying that um, that's what St. Paul says often. He says it here, but in Thessalonians, he says, Rejoice always, pray.
pray without ceasing, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus regarding you all. It must have been a Southern American, y'all. And um, so Christmas is awaiting in the dark ray of faith. But for me, it starts to become an icon of the birth of a new kind of prayer in the human family. The birth of a new kind of prayer, a prayer of preparation to live in union with the life of Christ beyond dualities and to discover that we are being given this bridal garment of union. Thank you. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let what you have said be done to me. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He went in and said to her, Rejoice, so highly favoured. The Lord is with you. She was deeply disturbed by these words and asked herself what this greeting could mean. But the angel said to her, Mary, do not be afraid. You have won God's favour. Listen. You are to conceive and bear a son, and you must name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will have no end. Mary said to the angel, But how can this come about, since I am a virgin? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel answered, and the power of the Most High will cover you with its shadow. And so the child will be holy and will be called Son of God. Know this too. Your kinswoman, Elizabeth, has in her old age conceived a son, and she whom people called barren has in her old age uh, conceived a son. Because nothing is impossible to God. I and the handmaid of the Lord, said Mary, let what you have said be done to me. And the angel left her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, uh, if you think that story is 
is easy to understand for just the little kids to do at nativity um, plays, then think again because it took 80 years of reflection on the mystery of Christ for that to emerge as a powerful, simple, beautiful, but deep and mysterious theology. Luke wrote his gospel for the Gentiles. He was a disciple of St. Paul. And the scholars say that he tried to uh, balance the already very different interpretations of Christ that were in circulation in the church at that time. He sees Christ as the Lord of history. But equally, he sees Christ as the expression of God's love, that love which especially was directed towards the marginalized, the poor, the excluded women in his time. that God has favorites, but then, but it is perhaps those people in society or that marginalized part of ourselves who, which is most receptive, it can be most receptive to that love of God in the strong ego defended parts of ourselves, the love of God has a, has a lot of trouble getting in. But in those poor, marginalized parts of ourselves, that's where our defenses are down. And we find in Luke, Luke's Gospel, uh, the themes of family, of love, of poverty, of justice, of uh, forgiveness throughout the gospel, manifestations of this love of God in which we swim. Mary was probably a very young girl. It was not unusual for, for common for girls to be betrothed at the age of 12 and maybe married at or soon after the age of 14. So the, the actress who plays uh, Mary in uh, Pasolini's film on the Gospel of Matthew was probably very accurate. But be careful in making drawing assumptions from that because it's this young girl, this young virginal girl, who is identified with a revolution. She's not just a sweet, submissive spirit, uh, a, a piece of property in a patriarchal society. Uh, she is a rebel. The Magnificat, her great hymn that she, that she expresses, uh, that she sings uh, in Luke's Gospel, speaks about scattering the proud, bringing rulers down from their thrones, lifting the humble, filling the hungry, and sending the rich away empty. The Magnificat became the centerpiece of liberation theology in the uh, second half of the last century. Bonhoeffer called it the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. So it was often banned in public uh, liturgies of public worship by the British in India, for example. They wouldn't allow it to be sung or spoken. 
and uh, in Guatemala, uh, I think in the 70s, and in uh, Argentina, where it became associated with a resistance to the forces of oppression. In Argentina, when the mothers of the men and boys who had been murdered by the military government uh, took the Mary as the mother of the disappeared and uh, their non-violent protests for, for revolution, for the true revolution. So again, this story needs to be listened to. The key word in the gospel of today is listen. How difficult it is to listen. The first word of the rule of St. Benedict. It's the deep meaning of obedience. Just as we find it difficult to obey, we find it difficult to listen. Before somebody has finished speaking, we have begun to form our own uh, opinion and we often interrupt or we push that out. But to listen means that we have to be silent. And Mary is associated with this quality of fertile silence, not the silence of oppression or of fear, but the silence of revolutionary, transformative listening. And that's her virginity. It's been interpreted in many different ways, but usually from a patriarchal point of view. In patriarchal societies still today in some parts of the world, uh, a girl or a woman who, has, who is not a virgin has soiled goods and not, not good anymore. And, uh, you know, you want to get the thing you want to buy, you want to make sure that it's still in its original packaging. Even Joseph, perhaps, tended to this when he was tempted to put her away quietly when he heard that she was with child. The story begins, the story of Jesus begins, even at this moment of conception, with God's identifying love with the marginal and the powerless. And we are never more marginal or more powerless than when we are silent. And we are not silent as long as we are thinking about ourselves. As long as we are thinking, this is a wonderful meditation. As long as we are thinking, I am, I am achieving a higher level of consciousness. That's a very subtle form of noise. But to be truly silent is to do what Mary does in this gospel, which is to say, let it be done to me as you have spoken. And that is interpreted as a second creation. It's the fiat, let it be, let it be done, with which God brought creation out of nothing at the beginning of time. And so this moment where Mary listens so deeply and consents so powerfully is a new creation. Can we just put up that picture again? Uh, just say, what I, uh, I'll just give a little summary of the Advent uh, reflection I sent out uh, yesterday or today. Um, because uh, I uh, don't think I can say it any better than what I said then. So this is a picture of Mary, as I said, walking up some steps and she's turning around becoming aware of a presence in the room or in the house or in her life. And it's a beautiful painting because it captures the unsuspecting innocence of her youth. 
was entering a world larger than she had ever known or suspected existed. In this moment, she's awakened from the dream of childhood and begins to be a woman. A woman who will love and suffer intensely. She's then told that she will be known by God. She doesn't understand what that means. God waits and she consents. The Gospels and later tradition emphasize the virginity of Mary. And however we may understand the meaning, it evokes the state of pure openness and the capacity to be surprised even by what for a long time we have strongly desired. You may want something very much, even when it comes, it surprises you. In the ancient world, virginity was regarded as a high, if fragile, spiritual condition. In modern culture, it's treated uh, as amusing or very transient. But these are social attitudes. The mystical meaning is found in the monastic idea of recovering your virginity, wherever the individual may start from. And that recovered virginity is a pregnant harmony of body and spirit, full of potency and joyful hope. This is the readiness, being ready, in which the awakening, the eternal birth of the Word of God can take place in us, so that the Word becomes our own flesh. God becomes our flesh. I think this is more what the Gospels are intending to convey by this idea of virginity, but it requires a more contemplative kind of reading. I think we might say that we feel more virginal after every meditation. So this is a very beautiful, powerful scene which starts the life of Jesus ticking. And Mary's virginal state allows this listening to happen, this dialogue with the angel to happen unselfconsciously. We don't feel that it's false or a divided consciousness. It's expressing something non-dual. In some way, if you're a believer, you feel it really happened. Yet it is always strange and mysterious. What's being discussed between Mary and Gabriel is an event in time that impregnates time with eternity. The same event throws the duality of God and creature up into the air and it goes up beyond sight and when it comes down to earth in her womb these two that were once separate are now one. So this youth-filled, pure heart of Mary and her conception of a new life join together. They express in a new way, in time, the non-duality of God and us. Humanity can see its own source and its way back in this beauty. From Nazareth and Bethlehem on, this human beauty, filled with the divine beauty, is now impossible to disentangle from God, from the God who is always younger than we are. And even in the worst of times, such as many people are passing through now, even in the worst and ugliest of humanity's thoughts or deeds, or the terrible history of human sin, this beauty, this innocence, will always be there to save us from ourselves.
as the gifts uh, come to the altar, let's uh, join our hearts and minds with love and friendship with all those who have asked us to pray for them. Let's pray especially for those who are suffering, disappointed, sad at this moment as we approach Christmas. Pray for those who are, who are, who are sick. I'd like to ask you to pray especially for a good friend and a friend of our community who is suffering a great loss at the moment. Pray for the repose of uh, Devon, of the soul of Devon Dalio, and for Ray and Barbara, his parents, and all of the family uh, for their most painful loss at this time. And let's pray also for Sandy and Noel in London. Pray for Mirella in Sydney and all those who have asked us uh, in the chat uh, during this Mass to remember them or those for whom they would like us to pray. Lord, you know our needs. You are present with us in our needs, even before we ask. And so we place these and all our prayers before you in confidence through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, let us pray that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the glorious and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. May your Holy Spirit sanctify these gifts we have placed upon this altar, just as he filled with his power the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our, to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For all the oracles of the prophets foretold him, the Virgin Mother longed for him with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist sang of his coming and proclaimed his presence when he came. It is by his gift that already we rejoice at the mystery of his nativity, so that he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in his praise. And so with angels and archangels and thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In the same way, when supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the cup of my blood the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim this mystery of faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to be in your presence and serving. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us go in love, together with Francis, our Pope, Pascal, our Bishop, and all your ministers, all those who serve your people. We pray for unity among all Christians, and we pray for friendship and working together among followers of all traditions. Remember, Devon, whom you have called from this world to yourself, Grant that he was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember all our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sin, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and the unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. 
peace of the Lord be with you always. Peace be with you. And this is the Word of God, made flesh, in Mary, in our hearts, that we are we who listen to his Word. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the Word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us to everlasting life. We meditate now for about 15 minutes.
Conclude our prayer. We give thanks <coughs> for this gift we have received, the sign of your presence, of your birth in us. And we pray that as this celebration of our salvation, our liberation draws near, we may listen all the more deeply to the word that you speak to us and in us. This we ask through Christ our Lord. So after the blessing, we're going to uh, put on the screen the, uh, our invitation to you to, to join in our celebration of Christmas, beginning on Christmas Eve at 10.30, uh, and then on Christmas Day at 12.15 with a contemplative Eucharist, and then on December the 30th, we also uh, remember with gratitude and uh, hope the anniversary of John Main and the beginning of the work of our WCCM around the world on December the 30th, also at 12.15. We'll put that up on the screen in a moment. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite you, as I said, to celebrate with us in the news at the moment it's all disappointing news that Christmas has been cancelled and uh, we won't be able to celebrate it but uh, we want to send out some better news than that which is the good news that, that we can celebrate this birth of Christ in us and in our world even in these dark days as we approach the, the darkest day of the year, <clears throat> uh, the winter solstice. It's also this year anyway, the, the time you, I'm sure you've read about the conjunction of uh, uh, Jupiter and Saturn 
the coming together of these two bright planets uh, in, in a great singularity of light. So even in the darkness, uh, there is hope, the beginning of the return. Uh, the, the days get longer. They don't seem as if they're getting longer past the 21st, but uh, we know that they are, and we will emerge into the light through this dark uh, time. So we wish you a very happy rest of Advent and preparation for the celebration of Christmas and hope that you can be with us uh, with that in some way as well. Let's ask God's blessing on each one of us who participated in this Eucharist, our friends and family, those who are mourning, those who are anxious, that we may share the peace of Christ with them in this blessing. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit come upon us and remain with us always. Amen.